Well, good morning, everyone. Um, if you have a Bible uh, to hand, do have it open at Mark's Gospel in chapter 13, Mark 13. We're going to be looking at the whole of this uh, chapter this morning. It's all going to be destroyed. Not one brick will be left on another. There's a great disaster coming. The town of Shepshed is going to be flattened. Imagine you heard that on the local news one morning. What would be going through your mind? What would you want to know? What would you want to ask? I guess when? When's it going to happen? What warning signs will we get so we can be ready? How do we know it's coming? Well, I'm not aware of an imminent disaster coming to Shepshed, but the Bible tells us that one day Christ is going to return in judgment and the whole earth will be destroyed, be remade, the new heavens and earth. I wonder, what questions do you ask when you think about Christ's return? Do you ever ask, when's it going to happen? Do you ever ask, well, what are the signs, the warning signs that we should look out for so we can be ready for when Christ comes? They're important questions, aren't they? Because there is a great day of judgment coming. The challenge for each of us this morning is, are we watching out for it? Are we prepared? Now, at the beginning of Mark chapter 13, one of Jesus' disciples points up at the temple and the the buildings around it and says, look at this, what amazing stones, what incredible buildings. And it was true, the temple of Jesus' day was big and remarkable, it was a great landmark. The Jews were very proud of it as the house of God. It stood out in the midst of the city, at the top. But Jesus says, in reply, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left on another that shall not be thrown down. It's going to be destroyed, he says. Wow. And so later on, not surprisingly, his disciples ask him about what he's been saying. What do they ask? When? When will this happen? And what about the signs? What are the signs that all these things will be fulfilled? When and uh, how will we know? They're the obvious questions to ask, I guess, aren't they? Now, Matthew's Gospel um, records this question a bit more fully for us, and that's helpful before we dive into the passage. Uh, he, He records it like this. The disciples ask, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. The disciples, you see, are asking about the destruction of the temple, but they're also asking about Jesus' return, the second coming. And so, when Jesus answers their question, or their questions, if you like, he's he's actually talking about two events and the signs that, that build up to them. And that's a real key to getting our head around what's going in this passage, because it's quite hard to interpret, I think. Otherwise, we don't know that. The first of those events is the horrific destruction of Jerusalem uh, by the Romans that took place in AD 70. That was a time when history tells us that over a million Jews were killed. It was a horrible time. The second is Christ's return. Thousands of years later, and we don't know how many, do we, because we're still waiting for it today. Now, the fact that these two are woven together does make it complicated to interpret the passages we've said, Uh, and and perhaps the the, the tricky question that lots of commentators wrestle with is, how do we know when Jesus is speaking about the temple and Jerusalem's destruction? How do we know when he's talking about the second coming? And and, and do we have to divide the passage up and figure that out? Well, I think the answer to that is, well, we don't need to divide the passage up particularly. Rather, what Jesus is giving us here is prophecy. Prophecy. And it's a prophecy with multiple fulfillments. The whole chapter is partly fulfilled in AD 70. That's the initial fulfillment, but it's only completely fulfilled. There's a full and final fulfillment in Christ's return. Another way of putting that is to say that the destruction of the temple 
which happened in the first century, points forward to Christ's return. And that's helpful for us practically if we find ourselves doubting whether Christ is really coming back. Is there really going to be a great return of the Saviour at the end of time? Well, remember that Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple 40 years after his time, and it happened just as he said. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple. He's a trustworthy prophet, you see, and more than a prophet, of course, but he's trustworthy. And therefore, we can trust him to fulfill the second part too. We can trust that he's really coming back. It's worth remembering that when we struggle with doubts. Well, our main focus then this morning on what is, is, is going to be on what this passage says about Christ's return. We will think about AD 70 as it points forward to that day. But the question is, what, what, what about the return and what about the signs and what about the timing of that? So the disciples asked about signs then. Jesus, in his answer to their questions, has a a lot to say about the signs to watch out for. Most of our passage is about that. But he's not giving them a kind of join-the-dots exercise. Um, He's not giving them a list of events that they can tick off so they can calculate the precise date of his return in advance. That's not what's going on here. His main concern is to warn them about what's to come so that they will be alert and ready. This is a passage of warning. He calls us to take heed or to watch out, to be alert and ready. And so we've got four points this morning, and each one begins with the words, watch out, watch out. First of all, number one, Watch out, says Jesus, that you aren't deceived. Watch out that you aren't deceived. Verse 5. Take heed that no one deceives you. Watch out, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. There were lots of people claiming to be the Messiah in the first century AD, and in the build-up to that destruction of the temple, it caused all sorts of chaos. There have been many false messiahs and many false gospels throughout the whole history of the church. There are many false versions of Jesus, many false gospels preached today in the world. We should expect that. We shouldn't despair at it. We shouldn't wonder what's going on. This is a sign that Jesus is coming back. There are going to be false gospels. Jesus' concern is that we shouldn't be deceived by them that we should be watchful, that we measure what we hear by God's words. But perhaps you're sat here thinking this morning, well, I know there's false gospels out there. The Jehovah's Witnesses are always knocking at my door. And, you know, sometimes I go on the internet and I find these people saying, give some money to my ministry and God will make you rich. I'm not going to listen to that. I go to an evangelical Bible-preaching reformed church I'm not going to fall for this stuff. And that's very good. It's very good you've got that sense of discernment. But you know, it is possible to sit in a good church and hear the gospel of grace preached every week and yet to believe a false gospel, a false version of Jesus in your hearts. A gospel of works, perhaps. A gospel that says if you live a decent life and you go to church and you are kind to people and you pray sometimes and you give some of your money, then God will accept you because you're a good Christian. There are lots of people sat in good churches who believe that. And you know, if that's what you really think this morning, you've been deceived by a false Jesus. Because the gospel says you can't save yourself. It says you've got no merit before God, only sin. And it says you must rely on grace alone. You must trust in Jesus' atoning work for you alone for forgiveness, for new life. That's the gospel. It's free. It's offered to you. You respond in faith. Don't be deceived by false gospels, false messiahs, friends. There's another type of deception here, though, as well. Looking out and reading world events. 
There are wars, aren't there? In our world, we look at Ukraine, and perhaps we, we wonder, what's going to happen if we end up with Russia and NATO going to war? There might be a nuclear holocaust, the end of the world. There are rumors of wars. What if Iran goes to war with Israel? What's going to happen? Is everyone going to get caught up in it? Is it going to destroy everything? This is the beginning of the end. And there are earthquakes and disasters and floods, aren't there? We hear a lot of talk about the devastating effects of climate change, and we might think, well, is that going to be the end of the world? Surely Jesus needs to come quickly before that happens. And of course, every so often, a Christian leader pops up somewhere and predicts the date of Christ's return based on what's going on in the world, and sincere Christians are deceived by it and then devastated when it doesn't come to pass. What does Jesus say? Verse 7, don't be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. So these wars and these disasters and earthquakes and so on, well, they are signs pointing to Christ's return, but in a particular sense. In verse 8, Jesus says that these things are the beginnings of sorrows. Beginning of sorrows. And if you've got your footnote in your New King James or you've got a different translation, you might see that that word sorrows really should be translated birth pangs or birth pains. Jesus is saying it's, it's as though our world has gone into labor, and that labor is going to take a while. Many women here, I guess, will be able to tell me just how painful labor is and how long it can go on. But normally, and I know that there are tragic exceptions, normally labor pain is hopeful, isn't it? Because a baby is going to be born. And in the same way, the wars and the disasters of our world, as painful as they are, and they're awful, they point to hope. They remind us that a new heavens and a new earth is coming at Jesus' return. Paul says, doesn't he, in, in Romans chapter 8, the world has been groaning in birth pangs until now. It's waiting for its redemption. We don't know when. But when we see the pain and the hurt and the war and the disaster, we're to remember that new life, a new world is coming. Christ is coming back to make the world again. Friends, Jesus would not have us to be deceived, not by false teachers, not by misreading what's going on out in the world. Rather, we'd have us to look forward in hope to his return. Watch out that you aren't deceived. That's the first thing. Secondly, watch out for persecution. Watch out for persecution. And here we need to see in this passage that there's persecution now and there's persecution later. Now, first of all, verse 9. Watch out, or take heed, it's the same word, for yourselves... For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. Or verse 12, now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. It's pretty tough, isn't it? It's pretty tough. But it's true, and it's realistic. Because almost as soon as the early church started preaching the good news of Jesus... They faced persecution. The apostles were dragged into court. They were imprisoned. Some of them were put to death. And tragically, that's continued throughout history, hasn't it? And today, in quite a few parts of the world, Christians who tell others about Jesus are arrested, imprisoned, sometimes even murdered. Go and read the website of the organization Open Doors. If you want to get a sense of the scale and you want to pray for those churches and those people facing the worst persecution. But you know, even here in the UK, if you go out and preach the gospel in the open air, and I think that's something we should be doing in the UK, but if you do that, you might find yourself accused and arrested. It's happened a number of times in recent years. Or if you speak up on behalf of biblical morality and truth on social media or in the workplace, you might lose your job. You might be removed from your college course. You might be investigated for a hate crime. You might. 
If you seek to tell your friends and and family that they are sinners in need of a saviour, and Jesus has come that they might be saved, you might find yourself mocked, ignored, not invited to family gatherings. Some of you here this morning will know what that feels like. It's hard. But Jesus says, don't be derailed by this. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. And he makes a promise. He makes a promise. When they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit will be with you in the middle of persecution when you're put on the spot when you have to speak up. He will give you the strength. He will bring to mind the words of Scripture that you need. Why? Why does he do that? Well, yes, because he cares for his people, but also because you're there as a witness to Christ. You are there for the advancement of the gospel. And Jesus tells us in verse 10 that the gospel will advance until it's been preached to all nations. That's God's purpose in persecution. We face persecution that the gospel might advance, that God might carry out his great work in this world. This is a sign, you see. Persecution is a sign that God is saving all his chosen people from every tribe and tongue and nation throughout all of history. And when that work is complete, he will return. So don't be surprised by persecution, friends. Rather see that in it, God is completing his work. He's bringing us to that day when Christ will return. When it comes, trust him for strength and help, and he's promised that he'll give it to us. Persecution now. What's going on in verses 14 to 23? Here I think we have persecution later. Persecution later. We've got a terrifying picture here, haven't we, of a a great persecution in Judea, in Jerusalem. People on the not coming down from the rooftops to go back into the house. People are fleeing for the hills. Jesus, I think, here is clearly talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 in the first case, isn't he? But remember that this is a, this is a chapter that is a prophecy with multiple fulfillments. The persecution in Judea before that just great destruction by the Romans points forward to a terrible period of persecution just before Christ returns. Look at verse 14. We've got a reference here to the abomination of desolation. And we could say a lot more about this than we have time to, but this phrase comes from the book of Daniel. It referred initially to a particularly terrible, pers- particularly terrible period of persecution that was coming. Um, in the second century BC, the Jews were persecuted. The temple was desecrated by a Greek uh, ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes. It was an awful time. But it's clear from the book of Daniel that actually this abomination of desolation always pointed forward to more than that. It would include the destruction of the temple in AD 70, but it also pointed to a great period of persecution at the end of time, just before Christ returns. And we find that elsewhere in the Old Testament and in the New Testament too, I think. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the man of lawlessness will come before Christ returns. This man will, this individual will proclaim himself to be God. He will lead a great rebellion, deceiving many people with false signs and wonders. He's the ultimate false messiah, if you like. There'll be a great persecution. This is the man known elsewhere as Antichrist. And there's much that's very mysterious to us about who he'll be and what these events will look like. But what is clear is it will be a a time of terrible persecution, the worst the world has ever known. But secondly, it will be short. Verse 19. For in those days there will be tribulation such as not been since the beginning of creation when God created, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose... He shortened the days. So why will that time, as terrible as it may be, why will it be shortened? Because God cares about his people. 
his chosen ones, his church. If you've trusted in Jesus and you find yourself alive in that period, remember, it's going to be short because God cares for you. It will be terrible. You might lose your life for the sake of the gospel, but you will not be lost and the church will not be wiped out. How is this time going to be shortened? How can we be so sure that we will be kept? Christ is coming back. And so Jesus has told us to watch out that we're not deceived. He's told us to watch out for persecution, both now and in the future. Now thirdly, we're called to watch out for the appearance of Christ. Watch out for Christ's coming. In those days, verse 24, after that tribulation, that period of persecution, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's what's going to bring it to a close. That's what gives us confidence, the dramatic appearing of Jesus. We'll see this great destruction, the great signs in the sky, the stars falling, the moon and the sun will be darkened. Everything will be shaken because a new world's coming and this one's being destroyed. And we'll look and we'll see Jesus. This isn't a quiet coming. It's not a hidden coming. None of us will miss it. Be there on the clouds in the sky for all to see. The language here, again, is the language of Daniel. So much about Christ's coming in the future relies on the book of Daniel. This is the language of Daniel 7, which talks about a great day of judgment on which the Son of Man will appear with the clouds of heaven and will be made ruler over all peoples forever. This is the day when everyone will see Jesus for who he is, the great, majestic, all-powerful king and judge. This is the day when the present world will be destroyed and the new heavens and earth will be made. This is the day when all will stand before the throne of judgment. This is the day, friends, when all who have rejected Christ, all who have carried on in their sin all their lives, all who have refused and rebelled against God throughout all of history, will be gathered to face their judge. Some will be raised from the dead. The majority will be raised from the dead to be there. And tragically, they'll be condemned to hell forever for their own repentant sin and rebellion against God. Friends, this morning, don't let that be you. Come to Christ. Because on that day, there's great news for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 27, and then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four wings, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. This is the day when all God's chosen people will be gathered. No one will be missed. Those who have died will rise first from the dead in resurrection bodies and they will be reunited with their souls that will come with Christ. Those living will be transformed in an instant and together we'll all meet Christ in the air and welcome him as the coming Lord and King. On that day, false messiahs, false gospels will be seen for what they are because the true messiah has come. They're false, they're foolish, they're weak. Jesus is there in all his majesty. On that day, all of the wars will cease. There'll be no more natural disasters. Sin has been done away with. The world is made new. On that day, persecution will be no more. On that day, you'll not be mocked anymore. You'll not be ignored anymore. You'll not be laughed at anymore. Christians won't die and be put to death and murdered and locked up anymore. When that day comes, all of his chosen people will have been redeemed and all of them will stand with him, vindicated for all to see. 
But friends, are you looking forward to that day? On that day, we'll see our Savior in his glory and in his majesty. On that day, we'll be like him, perfect. We'll be with him. And on that day, we'll begin to reign with him in the new heavens and earth forever. Oh, friends, watch out for his return. There's so many things that are hard in this world, so many things that are sad, so many things that distract, so many things that we, give us heartache and pain. Lift up your eyes. Watch out. He's coming in the clouds and you will see him, your glorious saviour. It will be a solemn day. But for those of us who know him, a glorious, wonderful one, watch out for the appearance, the coming of Christ. So we watch out that we're not deceived. We watch out for persecution. We watch out for the appearance of Christ. Lastly, Jesus says, watch out that you don't fall asleep. Watch out that you don't fall asleep. And I suppose this is a, it's a, 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 an appropriate point in the sermon just to say, don't fall asleep, we haven't got too far to go. But, more seriously, Jesus has given us some answers, hasn't he? to that question about signs. Lots of answers. There are going to be deceptions. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be a great final persecution. The disciples did ask another question, didn't they? When is all this going to happen? When? It seems like we've got two answers. I think in verse 30, Jesus says, um, um, this will all take place in the lifetime of this generation, before this generation passes away. I think probably there he's speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem. It's going to be within a lifetime, and it was. It was within 40 years. But what about the second coming? Verse 32. But of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Not even Jesus, as he was on earth in his humanity, understood the day, the time. It wasn't even revealed to him. And theologians try and work out what's going on there. And it's hard. But Jesus, at that point, didn't know. And if Jesus didn't know, as he was teaching, we can't expect to know either. Yes, we've been told that there's going to be a short final period of persecution before he comes, but we have no idea when that's going to be. So what do we need to do? Watch out. Be on our guard. Take heed. Be ready. Jesus gives us the picture here of a man going off on a faraway journey and leaving his servants behind to work and leaving a, a watchman on the door to, to be on the lookout. The man's going to return at some point, might well be in the middle of the night. And it'll be a disaster if that watchman's asleep and his servants aren't ready, they're not prepared. He expects to find them watching, ready for his return. Jesus, our great master, expects to find us watching and ready for his return. And if we are watching, if our whole lives, daily we're looking forward and saying, when is Christ going to return? He's coming back one day. If that's our mindset, what does that do to us? How does that affect us? It changes everything, doesn't it? It changes everything. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you've not trusted in Jesus For you, this means that you have an urgent need to come to Christ. An urgent need to turn away from your life of ignoring and disobeying God, to repent. And an urgent need to trust in Jesus for forgiveness and new life. Nothing could be more important for you. You might have all sorts of things on your to-do list, all sorts of pressing pressures upon you. But this needs to come first, friends. Because Jesus is going to appear in his great glory on the clouds when you least expect it. And then you'll be too late. And if you haven't trusted in him, that will be a terrifying, terrible day for you. You will stand before him as you are, in your sin, in your rebellion against him. And he will have to condemn you to hell forever. 
who have no choice. Justice demands that. So don't delay. Wake up from your sleep today. Trust in Jesus. He doesn't require you to do some great tasks to be accepted by him. He simply asks you to come and trust your life to him. Confess your sin. Trust in him to forgive you and make you his child. And he'll give you eternal life. And you can know that when he appears, you will look up and you'll see him with joy in your heart. For you'll be with him forever in the world to come. Trust him today. Well, Christian brothers and sisters, what about us? We've said it changes everything, didn't we? And so we could talk for a long time about what difference it makes to our lives. We just have a few minutes. So here are three things that watching out, that we don't fall asleep, looks like. Number one, staying awake means not getting too attached to the stuff of this world. Be thankful. Yes, of course, be thankful for possessions and money and career and time in retirement. These are gifts from God. Use them well. But don't make an idol of them. Don't make your life about them. It's easy to do that. Don't do it. Because when Christ returns, this world and all the stuff that belongs to this world will be destroyed. Jesus says, don't therefore lay up treasure on earth. Lay up treasure in heaven. Don't get attached to the stuff of this world. And then secondly, live holy lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't compromise with sin, friends. That's part of the world that's passing away. Rather, seek to grow in Christ-likeness. Live the life of the world to come. Seek to be as much like Christ as you can. Be transformed by faith in him. Be holy. And then lastly, share the gospel of Christ with the people around you. Will you warn them that one day Christ is going to appear for all to see and he's going to judge the living and the dead? Will you warn them that they're in their sin, they're under judgment, and will you tell them that wonderfully Jesus has come and he has lived and he has died and he has risen and he offers them free forgiveness, eternal life, hope. And all they need to do is come and trust in him. Will you offer that to the person you sit next to on the bus, the person who's in the cafe opposite you who says hello to your friends, to your family, will you go out and tell everyone about Jesus and his gospel? <coughs> you might face persecution. You might face mocking because of that. But you know, when your life is all about looking forward to Jesus' return, you'll not be put off by persecution because your great Saviour is coming back and you will be secure and you will be with him one day. Just as you'll not sink into despair when you hear the news and all of the terrible things going on in this world, because it points forwards to Christ's coming. Just as you won't entrust yourself to false teaching and false gospels, because the true Messiah is coming. Jesus is coming back, friends. He wants us to watch out that we aren't deceived. He wants us to watch out for persecution. Oh, he wants us to watch out for his glorious return, and he wants to us to watch out that we don't fall asleep. Will we pray for strength to do that? Will we look forward with hope and joy? Jesus says, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Amen. Well, we're going to finish with